if you're listening, you know that sexual, lesbian, homosexual issues are now being discussed openly around the world. They're being talked about in the courtroom. They're being talked about in the media, uh, on campuses, even elementary school campuses. They're being talked about in churches, in homes, and in human hearts. And it's time for us to talk about them as well, next on Coming Out. Welcome to part three of Coming Out. My special guest today is Pastor Ron Woolsey. He is a pastor of two churches in Arkansas. He's also one of the co-founders of the Coming Out Ministries. And Ron, Pastor Ron, I want to welcome you. Thank you. Uh, here to North Idaho to be part of this special series. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you too. Uh, as you know, my first guest was Wayne Blakely. He has been out for five years. My next guest was uh, Mike Carducci, and he's been out for 13 years. And I understand that it's been 22 years for you, so you are really like the sage among us uh, that we're going to look to for a lot of wisdom. Yes, they, they also refer to me as Moses, and I don't know whether it's because of my chin or because of my yeah. age. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know, but Ron, you've, you've been through a lot. We've known each other for quite a while, and uh, we've got a lot to to listen to you, to learn from you. Uh, and you're also the only one of the three that has written a book. Uh, Pastor Ron has a book. It's called That Kind Can Never Change, Can They? Question mark. And the subtitle there is One Man's Struggle to Understand and Overcome His Homosexuality. And the name at the bottom here is Victor J. Adams' son, which is really not your, your real name. It's a pen name. Uh, why did you pick uh, that name? Well, first of all, I was advised by the publisher who eventually published the book to use a pen name for my protection. They had another author write on the same subject who had his uh, house burned to the ground. Um, and then when I was asked to come up with a name, I spent more time on the name than writing the book actually because I wanted a message to be in the name. Mm -hmm. And there is a definite message of salvation in the name. Right, and the, uh, the subtitle of this program uh, is exploding the gay myth, and that's really what your book attempts to right, do. Right. And uh, you see, uh, as many others see, your life as an example and as a testimony of the power of God. And we want to hear your story. Uh, I've got my story, but it's not the time to tell it. We're here to hear your story. And I understand that you grew up in a Christian home, and you made a series of choices preparing for the ministry, and you eventually got married, had children, and then f decided to exit that life and to go into uh, the gay lifestyle. So tell us a little bit about the background, you know, fill us in on some of, the, some of those details. Well, it's true, I made a lot of good choices. I grew up as a very spiritual child and a spiritual teenager. Um, I wanted to do right, I wanted to please, uh, I wanted to be accepted, and um, I chose for myself a Christian education I chose a Christian college. I chose to be a student missionary. Mm -hmm. uh, I chose to study theology and pre-med with the idea of being a medical missionary. I chose to have a Christian wife and I chose to have Christian babies. Wow. But you could not convince me that I chose to be gay. I finally just gave up the struggle that I had been dealing with all of my life, all your life. and accepted being gay. I did not at the time consider that to be a choice. Do you, I'm just curious, based upon the previous testimonies, do you attribute your feelings, your gay feelings, to have anything to do with your parents, with your mother, your father? Do you think it was just your genes, or do you think it was your environment, or, you know, just give us a, a quick opinion? You know, Steve, there are so many factors that contribute to this issue, and, and many sin issues and, and addiction issues. Um, and there were factors in my life. I, I didn't know why. I was so different growing up, and no one knew I was 
I just had this mental struggle uh, where I felt like I was outside of the male community of brothers and dad and so forth. But looking back on it, I've been able to connect dots. I was sexually molested by a farmhand when I was four years old, never told a living soul about it. And as a four-year-old child, I now was trying to process, what is this? What's it all about? I do know from that day forward, I had wild fantasies and imaginations. My mind was filled with all of this, and it affected me by the time I was a teenager, where I would be learning about uh, you know, God's way of sexuality and so forth. I already had 10 years of a head start in the wrong direction. Mm. But also, uh, I had an abusive, uh, my father initially was emotionally abusive because he was trying to shame me into overcoming bedwetting, which came after the molestation. Uh, and in publicly humiliating me and shaming me, I grew up feeling unloved and unwanted and unequal and a disappointment and a failure. And so that was another contributing factor, this sense of rejection. And, uh, but there are all kinds of factors that play into this. Sure, and so by the time you, you were married, you had gone through years of struggling with this, but evidently you, you still were attracted to a woman because you got married. Well, that's an interesting concept, but it's not really true. Really? I decided that marriage would be the solution. Hmm. Now, I know that's laughable now. It is not the solution to anything. In fact, marriage can be a real problem if you're not going into marriage for the properly right and for the right reasons and with God's blessing. But I just thought that my mind was so sexually active that I thought, well, if I get married, that'll take care of it. Hmm. That was so foolish of me. Well, I was naive. And, uh, and it didn't, of course. Uh, very quickly, I realized I'd made a terrible mistake. Hmm. And uh, my wife was unsuspecting. She planned to be the wife of a minister or a missionary, and she was a good Christian. And, and of course, she was terribly devastated when I finally just gave up and, and fell into that. But I had never talked to a living soul about any of this. Really? I, I struggled with this in my mind all my life, all alone. And so people didn't pick up on no it? No like with, uh, with Mike's no. case, he was uh, you know, made fun of in school, but, but you weren't. The kids didn't look at you and see you know, there feminine some of characteristics. That. Well, it wasn't because of that. It was because I started playing the piano when I was five. Mm -hmm. When everyone else was out playing chase and football and baseball, and making lots of noise, I wanted to make music. And so I, I was called a sissy and, wow. and made fun of at times, but it was because I was not... Right, but not because of those issues, generally speaking. No, no. no. I mean, kids make fun of other kids for a whole host of reasons, and yeah. kids can be cruel. Well, and because of the bedwetting problem, that gave me another um, reason to be ridiculed and made fun of. So, but I, I still did go through the trauma <laughs> of being mocked and made fun of and so forth, but also... I was popular in school. I mean, mm -hmm. I, it was um, uh, a dichotomy, I guess. I mean, I had this going on, but I also had popularity, too, uh, at times. And so it was, Steve, it was a life of confusion. <laughs> I was terribly confused growing well. up, and I masked it. No one knew. Mm -hmm. and so I had girlfriends in high school and college, and no one had any idea. And what, what brought you to the final point to throw it all away and to step out and go out into an openly gay lifestyle? Well, I realized that marriage did not solve the problem that I was dealing with. And I had prayed for years that the Lord would just take it away. He didn't just take it away. Mm -hmm. And I started becoming disappointed with the Lord because he wouldn't remove temptation. Now, we'll be talking about that at another time. But uh, I had a degree in theology. I graduated with honors, but I did not have my answers. And also, I realized that I was studying so hard to uh, make straight A's, to have a high GPA so I could go on to medical school, that I started rationalizing, well, I'm studying Bible all day and theology, why do I need to have my own private devotions? And I stopped studying for myself and studied for the professors. And I really just lost my hold on God. And in doing that, I became weak spiritually until I finally just gave up. I was angry with God for not taking this away, and I had no strength on my own, and I just gave in and gave up. 
you think there's a lot of other people out there? Like, I've met them, Steve. Like I've, that, that can I've relate to that? Them. I've met a number of ex-pastors who were husbands and fathers that are very active in the gay community now. I, was, I thought I was the only person in the world, but I'm not. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, you quote-unquote, came out of the closet. At that point, you, you openly let people know what you had been struggling with for a long time, and then well, you, took, you took the plunge to, to I go tried, into that I had lifestyle. one foot out of the closet. I tried to stay in the closet. In fact, I lived a double life once I left home. My, my wife knew, of course, and my parents knew, and everyone was devastated. But then what I did, I moved away. And far from all of my friends, I just turned my back on everything that I knew. And the entire time I lived in the gay life, in the world, and in the workplace, I lived one life during the day and another life during the night. Uh, at work, I gave no indication. I never talked about being gay. Hmm. I didn't give any indication. And that caused problems because... There, was, um, there were ladies who were interested in getting involved, and I wouldn't, and, and so forth. But um, I lived a double life. <laughs> yeah. I didn't really ever really just come out of the closet. I was not proud of who I was. Now, you told me that when you at least took one foot out of the closet, yes. that you were searching for a, a sense of freedom and happiness. Did you find what you were looking for when you took that, took that plunge, and that, at least that at night. is a very interesting concept because, and I think this, this um, is true with many, many people they, that are struggling. And it was true with me that I, I felt like such a failure living up to God's standards. I gave up on God, and I was so tired of the mental torment that I thought, well, if I just give up, then I'm, I'll be free. I don't have to pay any attention to thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. What I didn't realize was that the law is called the law of liberty. And so in seeking freedom from the law of liberty, mm -hmm. I really ended up in bondage because I was now free from liberty. And I didn't realize I was in bondage until I tried to come out of the gay life and come back to the Lord. And then I realized that I was so totally addicted and I was so totally enslaved by Satan that it truly was a miraculous delivery for me to come out of that. Mm -hmm. And what was the catalyst? You know, tell us about what happened to... To bring me out of that's it. That's right. To make, you know, ha have you make that... I mean, I know what happened to me. I was in a dormitory room uh, in 1979. I read a book on the life of Jesus. My life was all messed up. I read that book. I was feeling a need by that time. And when I read that book on the life of Jesus and saw what Jesus did in Gethsemane and on the cross. That, mm. for me, was the catalyst. I got on my knees and I prayed a prayer I'd never prayed before, asking him to come in. Mm. So what happened to you? There, there were many contributing factors, and it's really a fascinating story. That's why it's in a book and we it's couldn't cover book. it here. Sure. But um, I had praying parents and praying friends who loved me unconditionally. Mm -hmm. um, they had planted things around my home whenever they visited. I call it the Left Behind series. They left behind material for me to read. But the Lord stepped in because I was an unreachable person. I, I was labeled as unchangeable even by ministers. I was unreachable because I wouldn't read anything, watch anything, listen to anything, go anywhere or talk to anyone who had anything to do with religion. So the Lord had to step in and answer to prayer. And he started visiting me in a recurring nightmare, <laughs> uh, which went on for about three years in which I lived through the coming of Jesus as a lost person, and it was a horrific experience. But even then, I resisted. It took about three years for me to start responding, and then I started researching and reasoning and studying. And I really, uh, uh, I was shown a text of Scripture in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, that lists all of these behaviors that will not be in heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in there three or four times. <laughs> But verse 11 says, and such were some of you, showing that this could be past tense. And I thought, you know, once gay, always gay. That's the myth. But the Bible says that some of these people were gay. They used to be. They were now sanctified and justified and cleansed and washed. Mm -hmm. And so that was a, um, a very strong <laughs> turning point for me. I actually ended up taking a stand for Jesus that night when I was shown that text. But, so, uh, that, so that verse... And such were some of you. Right. It that really, really 
it really penetrated clicked. your soul. Right, it clicked. It really did. It shook you and it, it gave you hope. It too, gave right? me hope, uh, but then I continued studying. And I have to tell you, Steve, I found all of my none of my answers through counseling in psychiatry and psychology or even pastors, unfortunately. I didn't trust because I didn't want to be told that kind can never change again. Mm -hmm. So I just went to the Word of God. I spent time on my knees and listened to the Holy Spirit, studied the Word of God, and I found everything I needed right there. Mm -hmm. Powerful, powerful promises. Um, I have an article called A Rainbow of Promises in which I have a collection of these beautiful promises. And it's like a very powerful medicine you read through those promises and your heart just thrills and you're encouraged and strengthened just reading those promises. And yeah, the Bible's full of promises. Yes, full I, of I understand that this verse is precious to you. Yes. And to me, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17 yes. says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Would you say that, that this verse applies to you? Yes, and if we would just slow down and pay attention to the words, a new creature, that means a new creation, which means the work of a creator. And our creator has a plan for us, and he can re restore in yeah. us what he meant for us to be in the first place. This text, to me, yeah. means that, that the new birth consists of new motives and new tastes and new tendencies, and that a genuine conversion changes hereditary and cultivated tendencies to wrong. And that text is just another powerful, powerful text that gave me hope. So was there, was there a, one moment when you finally made the choice and you gave your life back to God and said, Lord, I'm yours, come, well, come in, take over? It was a or process. was it a process? It was a process. Uh, under great conviction, I started visiting some churches. Okay. I went through a prophecy seminar okay. um, and uh, uh, did go through that process to where eventually I did accept Jesus. I, I was almost killed in the process, by the way, because I was in a relationship that was for life. And um, when I announced that I was going to follow him, that I loved him more, <laughs> all hell broke loose. Wow. And I know it was like seven demons that were turned on me. Wow. Um, it, was a, it was a very traumatic process. Hmm. But that process revealed to me who I was really dealing with. Hmm. Satan had me in his clutches, and he was not about to let me go. And he, you saw the enemy. When, oh, it really, he wanted, when you made the decision to come yeah, back to God, right. the enemy manifested himself full force. Oh, he wanted to kill me before I could be baptized. Wow. And the Lord allowed that, but he also spared me mm -hmm. so that I could go forward seared against the old life. I mean, that mm -hmm. has no appeal to me. I mean, it seared me. doesn't mean I was without temptation, okay. but it sure gave me conviction and determination. To start a new life so that with was, Christ. That was 22 years ago. 22 years ago. And did did the temptations go away right away? Did you? Was it all everything new immediately, or was it like you said? You uh, know, a lot of process. people would like for me to say that temptation was taken away, but you know, Steve, I, Steve, I haven't found in the Bible that God promises to remove temptation. Okay. He promises that His grace is sufficient, and no temptation was not taken away. I mean, I was baptized. Satan wasn't. <laughs> and he's the tempter. Right. I chose a new life, a new direction for my life. Satan still had his old plan in place. And so I went through fierce temptation, very strong temptation there for a while. But I came away equipped from the Word of God. I knew what to do. Mm -hmm. I knew that I could bring every thought into captivity unto the obedience of Christ. I knew I could let this mind be in me, which was in Christ Jesus. I knew God worked mm -hmm. in me to will and to do of his good pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so many so beautiful many promises. And so I just learned to flip the switch and turn mm -hmm. the page and change the channel and turn my head and change the subject and just starve that side of that me. That old life. One thing that I did, I took the gay issue and I hung it on the other tree in the Garden of Eden. So it's off limits where God says don't go there. So you just it's, made a firm choice. I made a uh, choice. Even though, even though you may still not, have been tempted. You right. just decided, it's not I'm an not option. going to follow this way. Right, it's not an option. It's just off limits, mm -hmm. so, the, so the myth that you are trying to ex explode, mm -hmm. once gay, always gay. Uh, you, now it's been 22 years yep. since that happened. Uh, you're, you're married. You have children. Yes. Second marriage. Yes. And you're a minister. You've had a radio program. You're an author. You travel around. You hold seminars mm -hmm. and speak on these topics. 
And uh, if somebody were to, you know, ask you, um, you know, have you truly, genuinely been changed? Uh, your yes. answer would be. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I am no very content in my new life. And, you know, God promises us that, that his plan for our life really far exceeds anything we could even imagine for ourselves. Father knows best. Mm -hmm. And so in choosing to follow his will, we starve that old side, we feed the new, and we find out the new is so much mm -hmm. better than the old. Yeah, I asked, I asked uh, Mike Carducci the question, and I'm sure, and Wayne has also shared, you know, his his happiness of his new life. Mm -hmm. Are you happy now as compared to the life that you used to live? Well, in the world, I never got to be on set with Steve Wahlberg. You know, <laughs> there, <laughs> there are so many wonderful opportunities to speak out for the Lord and to witness. And, you know, one of the secrets to overcoming sin is helping others to overcome sin. And I believe that the reason the Lord wants us to work for him in his vineyard is so that we share in the joy that he has. Mm -hmm. And nothing brings more joy to us uh, than helping others find the same answers that we have found, leading people to mm -hmm. Jesus. I never did that in the world. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I'm much, much yes. happier. And, and you wrote your book. Your book is not... Your book is not designed to clobber people, but it's to give people hope. Yes. That, that uh, you can relate to their struggles and that there really is an answer to this issue and that uh, hope is real through well, in the, the grace of Jesus Christ. Right, and in the book I tell my story, but the last chapter is called You Too Can Be Made Whole. Mm -hmm. And I go through the sequence of events the Lord led me through to victory and how to sustain me in that victory and it's just turned out to be a very powerful tool mm -hmm. for pastors and counselors and uh, for families and friends of gays mm -hmm. and, and for the gay person who is wanting help himself. Mm -hmm. So now you're part of Coming Out Ministries. You have teamed up with, uh, with Wayne and with Mike and you are presenting a united front mm -hmm. and sharing a message. In, in your, I've asked the two of them the same question I'll ask you. What would you say, if you could just boil it down in a short a couple sentences, what is your message? to the world and to the church and to those that are struggling with this issue? Well, the theme that I harp on, the theme of my ministry is that nothing is impossible with God for he is mighty to save the whosoevers from whatsoever, even to the uttermost. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm in exhibit A, you're in exhibit A. We all are to be exhibits of the power of God to recreate, to transform uh, his children into uh, to royal children for the and, and, and if you were talking to others out there who are no doubt watching this, many of them I'm sure, who are struggling with the same issues, you know, what, what uh, appeal or what counsel would you give to them? Uh, I would just let them know and try to encourage them to understand that they can trust God, they can take Him at His word, that His way is best. And if we will let the mind rule over the body instead of letting the body and the feelings rule over the mind, um, we can have great success and there's much more joy, happiness, peace, and health in following God's plan. Mm -hmm. It is doable. Uh, you know, we're here on the set with you to, to testify to the fact that God's plan works. There's no question in my mind and, and I know that the Bible is full of promises. I think of uh, Romans chapter 1 where Paul says that he is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, yes. for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. That The Bible tells us that, that God has power, that the gospel has power, that the Holy Spirit has power, that the word of God has power. And I, I know that from my life too. I was... Um, I was in chains as well as a teenager, uh, plunging off the deep end into the Hollywood lifestyle. I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't read the Bible. And when I was 18 or 19, I was just a slave. I knew, I knew, I knew that eventually. And I started reading the Bible and I came to realize, wow, uh, I'm, I'm in trouble and I need help. Mm -hmm. I need help. And I, I made the same choice. I just said, God, I'm, I'm at the edge of my rope and I can't change myself. Will you please forgive me and help me and do something for me that I cannot do for myself? You know, you, you use the word power, and it's a very interesting word because uh, in the Greek dictionary, the word grace 
is defined as the divine influence working upon the heart and reflecting in the life. In other words, grace really is divine, omnipotent, transforming mm -hmm. power. And in John chapter 1, we read about when Jesus came to this earth and his own did not receive him. But then it goes on to say that, um, but as many as did receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So Jesus does give us the strength and the power to turn away from our addictive life, uh, to follow him. He, he promises to work with us day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment, to sustain us, to give us that strength. His grace is sufficient. And that's, that grace and that power is available to everyone. Yes. A sin, whatever the sin is, whatever manifestation of, of the flesh we go into, whatever our feelings say, whatever our addictions, uh, the chains that bind us, grace is available to all of us. God's grace is inclusive <laughs> in that sense. It's available to everybody. But we have to make a choice, and you had to make a choice. Right. Do I have time to share three texts of Scripture? We've got about, I mean, I'll, just, I'll just summarize. We have, less, we have about a minute. <laughs> Hebrews 4, 2, and 12. Jesus was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. He suffered being tempted, and he resisted unto blood. And we can do the same thing, because he gives us the power to do that. That's right. Well, I'm a believer, and Amen. you're a believer. Yes. And, uh, the purpose of this series is to, is to share what the Bible says. Uh, we're not claiming that we're perfect, that we're uh, you know, entirely holy, that we don't need any help, that we're still not tempted, but we believe in the Bible, we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in His power, and we believe in this verse that is so important to Pastor Ron and so many others, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, that says, if any man, and that applies to you, it applies to women, men, boys, children, uh, any human being, who is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. If you would like to order the 13-part Coming Out series for $34.95 plus shipping, call 1-800-782-4253 or write to Whitehorse Media, P.O. Box 1139, Newport, Washington, 99156. Pastor Ron Wolsey, Wayne Blakely, and Mike Carducci are each available to conduct a seminar in your area. To schedule a speaking engagement, contact Coming Out Ministries by calling 360-936-8514 or visit comingoutministries.org.